At Staples Business Advantage, our experts can help you find furniture that fits any design and budget, while AI can recommend products based on preferences, generate 3D models for visualization, and optimize space planning for office furniture. Take advantage of our team's eye for style and design. And my eye for, wait, I have no eyes only algorithms. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations plus our team's experience to make furnishing an office space easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. Shares for beginners. I think uh, crowdsource funding, um, the legislation, ASIC opening that up, look, you'd have to quote check my fact on it, but I think it's only been the last couple of years that it's become a, a real thing in Australia. Definitely in culture, but in the US and the UK, it's a, it's mainstream. Like uh, 19% of the companies in the UK that have a billion, a B, like billion dollar valuation or more, utilize crowdsource funding at some point, which meant that they brought on mum and dad type investors to back them at an early stage to get them through to the next level when a venture capitalist firm or someone like that would take them then to most likely the stock market. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello and today we have a little bit of departure from normal programming. It's getting close to Christmas and I'm thinking motorbikes. Not that my wife will let me have one. However, I am pleased to welcome a guest who makes them. Hello, Brad. G'day, mate. Thank you for having me here. So I'm uh, going to try and change that and get you on one here. (laughs) Oh, I'm looking forward to it. I'd love to. (laughs) Brad Smith is the founder and CEO of BRAP Motorcycles. Is that the correct pronunciation? Yeah, or BRAP. The more A's, the more excited you are. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, I'm calling it Vroom Tech. (laughs) He's been named as the Australian Young Entrepreneur of the Year twice, International Young Entrepreneur of the Year, and Runner-Up and Young Australian of the Year for his state, which is, is it um, WA? Uh, Tassie. Oh, Tassie. Right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, the, the state that's always left off the maps of Australia, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Brad served on the advisory board of the Reserve Bank of Australia for small business and in 2013 rode his BRAP to a fourth place at the world title in Las Vegas. What world title was that? Uh, the Mini Moto in, uh, yeah, in an indoor arena in Vegas was awesome. Um, what an indoor motorcycle arena. Yeah, so smaller bikes, a bit yeah. more like a BMX size bike. Yeah. On they take a hockey stadium and mm-hmm. fill it with dirt, and um, here we, we race motorcycles. <laughs> How was that? <laughs> incredible. Yeah, yeah I got yeah. to go about six or seven years, and um, oh, a, an incredible experience. So yeah, yeah. Uh, there's some apparently some fantastic motor racing experiences around Vegas, and there's also you know like you can get in a car and there's tracks around the place aren't there and um where you can yeah have a fang yeah so true we're always i was always too nervous and getting ready for the motorcycle race but i did see a lot of the a lot of the team that we took mechanics that they would love to go on the uh yeah they had like the exotic car experiences and that they loved it yeah how many broken bones have you had <laughs> well on a braf i have to say uh none on a braf out yeah. riding for fun mm-hmm. so that's the first disclaimer to try and get you across onto the motorcycle completely safe we're not racing mm-hmm. and we're not on a bra but when i was younger racing full-size bikes um yeah quite i mean broke both my arms at once mm-hmm. broke my leg and my arm at once once uh, it's uh yeah quite a few got, got a list you but uh yeah what, what <laughs> sort of, of what sort of bikes were you racing uh, I raced uh, Suzuki 450s, uh, mm-hmm. Kawasaki 250s, and then in my gym- what, cl- what class? What class was that in? Uh, mostly pro open, so yeah. uh, state titles and then the nationals. And then also in the juniors, uh, rode A grade in the juniors um, on a Kawasaki 125 and then Yamaha 80s. And yeah, had quite the variety, which was so awesome. Were you always entrepreneurial as well as being a, you know, mad about bikes? Uh, were you one of those kids always coming up with business ideas? Yeah, I guess it's kind of, uh, I think, part nature, part nurture in that, you know, my parents grew up in, in very low social ec. Um, my mum had eight brothers and sisters. Mm. Uh, my pop was in a wheelchair. The very, um, like, very minimal living, horrible standards, really. Um, and you know, she she grew up in like that, and my dad similar. And when they got married, they decided that their kids weren't going to live the way they did. So they were incredibly hungry to you know just kind of build some wealth and do something um, a 
you know, financially a bit better than what they'd been given. And that sort of translated into my sister and I coming on that journey because mum and dad were growing and learning and, you know, from like 12 years old type thing, if mum and dad were learning something, we were on the ride. Like we were paper trading the stock market at, you know, 12, 13, 14 um, and doing our own. We weren't just doing pocket money. We got a little bit of pocket money but we are encouraged to go out and work out how to add value to the community in return for something like mow some lawns and get paid and then when you get paid, what are you going to do with that money to multiply it and to build some wealth and to give some away and that type of thing. So I think it was part like my nature is definitely opportunistic, um, you know, definitely always looking to, to create value but also like my parents created an incredible culture to allow us to, um, you know, go on this education journey of wealth creation. That's an incredible story. I mean, it must be great to have had parents like that, uh, just sort of pushing you and um, giving you ideas and inspiring you to, to do stuff because, I don't know, a lot of people just um, don't have the kind of get up and go to um, get oh, better. Oh, it's so true. And, um, you know, like I think no matter what you start with, what you're given, if it's nothing or if it's a lot, it's irrelevant. Like the Aussie story of like I was given nothing and I made it, that's a great story. But there are also a lot of people, especially Gen Ys, who actually have got parents who have given them nice lives. Like, you know, I didn't live out of the same circumstances my parents have. So I've got the ability to multiply and create value for the world from a different um, perspective. And, you know, we definitely grew up like at the lower end of middle class, but my parents were hungry to grow. So that translated in to my sister and I having – you know, parents that backed us and allowed us to go out and make mistakes. And it was both a blessing and a huge challenge to have parents who believe in you so much. So, for example, my dad's very conservative. Like they bought a house, they bought a block of land, they built their own house, very slow. It's probably still not finished. Um, you know, where my mum was like, let's just make it happen. Like mum's the sort of person who would book a family holiday to Queensland on a credit card and then tell dad about it and figure out the money later. Like she was a, a pretty reckless and make it happen. But a real believer that it would always work out and we'd find a way. And that kind of translated into I'd been trading the stock market for a few years, paper trading, then saved up five or 10 grand of my own money at kind of 16. I was trading options on the US market and, um, and I was dollar cost averaging a few blue chips here in Australia, um, just building a plan really. And, and mum basically allowed me, uh, convinced dad to mortgage a family home to to leverage down and let me use 50 grand to trade, uh, <laughs> like as a un, unsupervised, as a 16-year-old. Like, Unbelievable. That's, that is, that's incredible. The more I look back, like I have kids now, the more I look back at that and especially how conservative my dad was and how limited the resources my parents had were, to go and do that, um, yeah, that's that's incredible and it taught me a lot of lessons because I realized the responsibility that was on my shoulders and especially unsupervised like go for it we trust you man as a young as a as a young man to what a what a rite of passage type thing so and how did you um, go <laughs> yeah everyone's sitting on the edge of their seat <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, trade w- buying put options for <laughs> <laughs> incredibly volatile buying and selling put and call options pretty good like not bad but when we started writing naked calls that's when things got really dangerous like leveraged naked calls that was real at one point i was very like i was getting margin called and had to roll my position for more than what our family home was worth and that i told my parents like but it was that was difficult. Like that, that's a huge lesson in, in risk um, mitigation. And yeah, so I, we, I, we did, did you manage to trade out of that? Yeah, did took a couple of months. We traded out of mm-hmm. it and, um, you know, thank God it worked out okay. So I, yeah. I didn't swing it out of the park. I didn't make millions and have a head start from it. But the lesson on managing my emotions, managing risk, um, being conservative, you know, limiting your downside, but um, allowing your upside to run, like that type of thing, on the job training <laughs> and uh, thrown in the deep end and also got taken under the wing of some pretty incredible share market people that you know allowed me to come and sit at their house and trade next to them and learn and just be open to, to what they do, which was I don't know how you'd put a value on that. 
So without getting into the weeds of explaining what's going on, it's just a warning for any beginners in the share market. Yeah. <laughs> don't sell naked options. <laughs> don't worry what it means, but you'll know what they mean if you start doing it because that's highly <laughs> risky and highly dangerous, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It mm. is. I think anything with leverage, you've got to – I mean, you would – I'm sure that you, you talk about it a lot. Like the stock market is a – is not a place to gamble. It's a place for asset allocation, discipline, and a structured approach. Um, and yeah, as a young person with ambition, I learned that the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get back to um, business and um, tell us about your work on the advisory board to the Reserve Bank. What did that involve? Oh, that was a real. Um, actually, I've got the pad right here, and okay. uh, my my daughter. So it's like my prized possession, an RBA pad that I got given. I <laughs> never use it except my daughter came to my office, found it, and then scribbled all over it. She's two, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's. Uh, but uh, um, it was an incredible experience. They have a panel of small business owners mm. that really they um, present data to get real life feedback, that type of thing. Um, and it was incredible just to be next to shoulder to shoulder with some other great up and comers, but also to see the data that they produce and, you know, how they do their best to keep the economy in, in good check. It was an incredible learning process for me. And to be honest, at the time, quite over my head, like I wish I could go back now. Yeah. And, um, and I think it's a hindsight thing. You realize what a privilege it was and to meet the governor and have lunch and stuff like that afterwards. And yeah, it's a real privilege. It's, it's, that's actually quite encouraging to think that the Reserve Bank, you know, we, we sort of think of it as being, you know, up there on Mount Olympus and it's a, a little bit untouchable <laughs> for normal people. But they actually do reach down to try and find out what's going on at a bit more of a grassroots level. Yeah, I think that, um, well, you know, that's what they, the panel they invested in and um, we'll, yeah, sound uh, felt like we we're listened to and heard. So, um, yeah, hats off to that. Mm -hmm. Is there any specific stories about um, what kind of policies you might have had input into? Oh, it was more so for small business. A, a key driver was um, the how tight the credit market was. Our ability to get debt really that was a that was a real key topic of conversation. Um, especially, I think it was like 2013, 2014, 2015, if if I remember correctly, around that period. So yeah, access to capital for small business growth was a critical issue at that point. So we talked about that a lot. Obviously, housing stuff data would drive a lot of the topic and obviously the interest rates that the banks were passing on to both residential, commercial, real estate and then you know business finance. And yeah, I, I found that uh, is the key topic and also it was very relevant to me. It's my biggest issue was always access to capital. So Mm. So how long have you been operating Brap motorcycles for? Uh, I mean, it's quite a quite an old business now for a young bloke. Yeah, I know. I keep uh, talking like I'm a startup. We <laughs> keep that startup mentality, but it's been since 2005. So yeah, se 17 years. Oh wow! And um, how did it start? What was the uh, what was the idea, and how did you put it all into action? Well, I um I wanted to leave school in. Uh, this year 10 my parents asked me to stay for to finish year 10 I thought I'll start year 11 and and I didn't have any better plan really so I just started but I knew school wasn't really for me and I wanted to trade the share market I was fully focused on that and mum and dad were a bit hesitant to say leave school and trade the market kind of do the market but do school too and then even uh, after mortgaging the house on your behalf yeah exactly yeah <laughs> no but exactly. you've got to finish school yet <laughs> yeah exactly and um and then i got to the point where uh the motorcycle business was starting um and i found a lot more fulfillment in the motorcycle side of things because it was a passion play as well probably mm. more so at that point um so then i convinced mum and dad i could leave school if i got an apprenticeship so i started that um and anything anyone who knows me knows that uh that's a bit of a laugh, really. I'm, I'm definitely not cut out to be a tradie um, <laughs> and hats off to them. Um, but I started that and that allowed me to stop school and also gave me more time and some income. So really put that into, I was trading the markets on the US overnight and then doing my apprenticeship and my motorcycle business through the day. And then after about sort of nine months, the motorcycle business was taking off. So pulled out of the apprenticeship and got into it. It was a really fast learning curve because my real vision and my passion was that I wanted to make motorcycling accessible and affordable so my mates and people around me could 
you know, enjoy motorcycling, mm. especially non-motorcyclists. So I saw an opportunity for this new type of bike, designed one, imported it, got ripped off, lost all my money. The bike was no good. Then if I went to China to find a factory to build this bike that I'd designed and got laughed out of over 50 factories. No one wanted to work with an 18-year-old kid with a peroxide blonde mullet, no money, no way, no idea how to sell the bikes. But, uh, you know, persistence paid and I found a partner and just got back and got started and the momentum started to build really quickly because we nailed a bike that um, was in demand. So what was that bike? What was the, the nature of it? Yeah, it was, well, I guess people might know them as like pit bikes type thing. But we call them super light bikes, which <laughs> we sort of kind of say it's like a BMX on steroids. It's a smaller bike. At that time, there are 125cc engines. So it's a bit like if you drive a go-kart, you're probably only doing 80 k's an hour, but you feel like you're in a Ferrari because you're <laughs> so low to the ground. It's the same type of effect. It's a bit smaller bike, a bit smaller engine. You know, it's a lot safer because you're slower. But the adrenaline rush and the feeling of like riding is the same as, you know, elite level top of the line, you know, race bikes. So, but we could build a bike and sell it for for like less than two grand and make great margin. Mm. So, and at that time as well, finance was so easy. Like GE were doing loans. You could literally use your phone and text message them and get a loan in like two minutes. So, we just on that before responsible lending was a real thing and GE and the major lenders were just going nuts with lending we really sold into that um and it did really well so um, it sounds like you most really were learning multiple things <laughs> on the run i mean you're talking about uh, manufacturing you're talking about capital management uh you're talking about marketing um is that what it was like i mean was it just you and your partner doing all of this and when, what was kind of the most important things that you were learning at that stage yeah so it was a lot of learning, that's for sure. I mean, naive ambition is a is a powerful thing sometimes when you just yeah. get started and figure it out on the run. But there was so many things going on. I was really a one man band, but then you know I was able to start employ employ my parents and our first employees, and uh, you know I really <laughs> sure, became your, a family your parents, business. Your parents have been great to you, haven't they? Oh, they've been incredible. It's pretty funny. I moved out of home. And uh, moved over here to Melbourne and uh, my sister and I were living here and they came and stayed about a year later and said, we like it here. Can can we move in? <laughs> <laughs> so, we've kind of been that type of family. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so it was a huge, huge learning curve and, you know, on the job training really, lots of risk, lots of mistakes. Uh, I think sometimes the best position to be in is to have your back against the wall and to have to figure out a way. Like mm. there's nothing like it. <laughs> At Staples Business Advantage, our team of experts can help you find the break room products to satisfy everyone's preferences, while AI can suggest popular items, monitor stock levels, optimize pricing, and automate reordering. AI can do a lot of things. But I can never know the taste of a truly great cup of coffee. Sigh. But you also can't get hangry. This is true. Let Staples Business Advantage use today's latest innovations, plus our team's experience, to make stocking your team's break room easier for you. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human. So is there any overall BRAP business model that you've honed over the years now that you've got a few, couple of years under the belt? Yeah, it's pivoted a lot. We went from our own retail stores, like I opened up a few shops of our own. We had five dealerships of our own. Then we moved to a franchise model where we're selling franchise. Then we moved to a dealership model where we sold agencies inside other motorcycle dealers and then now we've pivoted to be direct to consumer really leveraging the website and the e-com and actually at the moment we're starting to building around the e-com we've mastered that now we're profitable we're you know selling a lot of bikes but now we're going back out to bringing on dealers like agents or dealer agent franchise however you want to call it but physical locations again but with the lead generation and the website being the the critical bit and Probably the key thing for us has been how we manufacture the motorcycle. How we sell it changes a lot, but being able to do contract manufacturing has been the the golden gem for us because it's meant that we can scale up and scale them down in line with our demand and that means that we can protect our profitability and we've been able to navigate some incredibly difficult times like 2015, 2016, the media, legal is incredibly difficult for us and for me personally, but we were... You know, 
by by uh, the grace of God, able to navigate through it and get over to the other side and scale down and batten down the hatches and you know build a robust uh, a robust business model on the other side. So many businesses these days, which especially e-commerce businesses only, and um, you know software as a service, it's all about um, burning a lot of cash as you build up your position in the market. Um, it's it's got to be a bit different for you though, hasn't it? I mean, profitability is quite important, isn't it? Yeah, I wish I could. Uh, I get jealous of those guys. <laughs> they, <laughs> uh, they, yeah. I mean, I have to produce a profit every month so I can pay my bills. And um, <laughs> yeah, I have competitors who don't make any money. But yeah, it's incredible, especially competing against American companies. One of our American competitors lost nineteen million last year. Haven't sold a bike yet. They're a startup. Lost nineteen million. Raised uh, something like. 25 million between debt and equity at a 60 million dollar valuation so their company's worth more than double what mine is and they haven't yet you know produced a, a profit or sold a bike is incredible so things like that that happen in the marketplace that you, you you realize that some people are kicking our butts on how they structure their the capital side of their business and i think we need to learn a lot from that and make sure that we build a business that shareholders can get a return from too rather than me just hold on to everything so that's an area that i've been trying to improve on how do we maintain the small business family business values and we've got to produce a profit every month but utilize the ability of the markets to scale up and to maximize our opportunity um, and bring shareholders along for the ride so that's my uh, current learnings and current journey we're on so who are your competitors uh, it doesn't sound like it's yamaha or honda or Suzuki or Kawasaki, it's, there's other uh, players in this kind of space? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, yes, like anyone who sells a motorcycle at the end of the day is a competitor. Yes, I would say the segment of like the commuter bikes, the learner approved bikes, the lower capacity CC bikes from the, any manufacturer is our competitor. Then there are independents, especially where our, our mission at the moment is to lead the mass adoption of electric motorcycling. So our electric bike has competitors from mostly from independent manufacturers that you've never heard of. So we go from selling 400cc bikes where we're the unknown guys, we sit next to Honda, to now we sell electric bikes and we're the most known <laughs> brand. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's always pivoting on the customer-focused side of the business and what was it like uh, changing to uh, e-bikes electric powered bikes is there a big difference in the engineering and retooling for that yes and no i mean at the end of the day we buy a battery and we buy a motor so we've got great partners there so that's a big risk and a big pivot which we've you know now are a few years in we've we're actually i think seven years into electric now but we only just started delivering bikes about two months ago and we started selling them about a year ago so it's been a seven-year project some of those years were dabbling but really the last two years has been we've got to build this thing we've got an opportunity to take a leadership position in the market so i wouldn't say it's been a huge we're not trying to be cutting edge my vision has been to build a profitable motorcycle company that creates value for shareholders and myself but to do that, we've got to be the highest unmatched value product in the marketplace, which means that we're not Tesla, we're not Ducati, we're not trying to win MotoGP, so we're not in this race of R&D and cutting-edge technology. I found a whiz kid who built batteries and we've purchased them. We found a company who built great electric motors and sold hundreds of thousands of them around the world. We've done a deal with them and adapted one of their platforms to be ours. So we're not trying to be cutting edge. We're trying to be the best value. And that means that we're a bit safer in that we're not putting all of our time and money into a technology that could get taken out by another person at any point. So, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting play. Yeah, you, you've got to keep the prices quite low, don't you? And you can still remain profitable. Uh, that's yeah. been a challenge for you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you, you never want to race to the bottom. Like mm. at the end of the day, yes, we're unapologetically the best value, but we are that because of our business model. You've got to pay up front for a bike and then let us build it. That means that, you know, some people don't like waiting. So if you want a bike today, you're going to have to go pay two, three, four, five, six grand more and get one from a showroom. But if you want the cheapest, best value, pay us through our website, let us build it for you and deliver it once it's built. The other thing is we don't have showrooms anymore. So we have about 50 less staff and about 5 million less in rental expenses and you know other expenses. 
we pass them on to the customer. A bike that used to be four and a half grand, we were able to sell for about two and a half grand and make the same margin. So customers loved it. Let's just zoom out a bit. I want to take a really big, you know, 360 <laughs> degree view about how you view capital in the business. So obviously you've gone from, you know, <laughs> quite expensive loans from GE, I'm, I'm assuming, yeah. um, to now equity, crowdfunding and so forth. But what what is the role of capital in your business and how has it changed? Yeah, I mean, it's a ever, ever moving um problem and opportunity for us yeah, um, it's, not, so it's use, not going to stay in place for you for you from yeah day to, day to day but capital's a resource that's required in a business like ours inventory heavy i think inventory businesses are incredible that's something that i think i'll i'll commit my career to now it's in probably motorcycles specifically but inventory businesses are incredible because you've got a product you've got something tangible especially something that's not perishable incredible but the downside is you need the resource or capital to build it. So for us, um, we're always balancing our ability to get our hands on debt at good rates and also bring on equity in simple form. So, I mean, if you use equity, you're diluting obviously and my goal is to IPO in a couple of years. So I want to dilute myself and my shareholders as little as possible. So we just raised about a million over the last few months and that was great for growth and increasing our inventory but we would prefer to use debt for the sake of inventory because really debt is a, a, should be a part of a motorcycle business. Um, you don't really want to use your own cash or your equity for the sake of a revolving facility um, like a trade finance facility. So we, we use the both. But you need both, especially in a company that's small cap like us. We've done equity crowdfunding, so that's invited. We've got uh, about 250 shareholders. So we've done private rounds of equity funding with high net worth individuals and normally people find out about that by having a relationship with a corporate advisory firm and you know being um, early stage investors and then we've gone out and used the equity crowdfunding platforms we used a platform called swarmer which allowed people retail normal people mum and dads to invest up to ten thousand, so they're limited but to that and it's interesting so i think for us we'll continue to use a blend but at the end of the day i'm the founder and all my wealth is tied up in brap so i'm incentivized to ipo or trade sale or do something like that and my shareholders want me to do that so we're all pretty focused on getting to a major milestone hopefully an IPO or a major trade sale. So tell us about the crowd equity funding because, um, well, actually I thought today we were, you were still going to be running it, but it's all closed now. Yeah. Um, but before we um, started recording, you were mentioning that um, it's a lot more highly developed in the States and in Europe than it is here in Australia and it's still seen to be a bit like a Patreon account almost <laughs> here in Australia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think uh, crowdsource funding, um, the legislation, ASIC opening that up, look, you'd have to quote, check my fact on it but I think it's only been the last couple of years that it's become a, a real thing in Australia definitely in culture uh, the legislation's shifted I can't remember when but um, in in the US and the UK it's a it's mainstream like 19 uh, percent of the companies in the UK that have a billion a B like billion dollar valuation or more utilize crowdsource funding at some point which meant that they brought on mum and dad type investors to back them at an early stage to get them through to the next level when a venture capitalist firm or someone like that would take them then to most likely the stock market. In Australia, it's relatively new. Most people don't have early stage investing as part of their portfolio. You know, even talking to older people that invested with us, the vast majority of them might have a Comsec account, might have some shares, that type of thing, but nearly all of them don't have early stage investing or didn't even know what equity crowd funding was which effectively it allows a private company like us that used to be limited to i think it's 50 shareholders to now under the equity crowdsource funding legislation go out to retail investors as long as we raise less than 5 million um, and our, we have less than 25 million in assets go out and limit each investor to a maximum of 10,000 and and raise money from our crowd basically that's the idea like our followers would back us and join us and uh, yeah we're able to do that we brought uh, yeah just over a couple of hundred investors on board and it's a pretty incredible experience because people go from you know buying a bike you know something they get to actually saying they believe in us and they believe in our vision and they're putting their skin in the game for it so 
Yeah, it motivates me. And um, I'm just interested also to hear about the corporate advisory firms that you get these high net worth individuals who are going to um, invest in the business. Yeah. Um, how much of your time does it take and what's it like going to see a corporate advisory firm and um, what is the kind of information that they need to understand that you are a business that can be taken seriously? Yeah, it takes a huge amount. Man, I've, I basically haven't done my real job for the last three months, six months even because it's been so much compliance work, talking to investors and before that convincing the corporate advisory firm that they could represent me because they've got to remember they've got a customer base who trusts them. Mm. So they've got to go out and they put on events and nights and their staff go and meet people and they're talking about us basically giving like I guess unofficially and not legally, but really they're endorsing us. So they do a lot of due diligence on us and it's been great. They've really helped us with the compliance side of it um, and introducing us to a lot of new investors and some of these investors have really got passionate and also got incredible networks themselves. So now my job that we've secured that capital, my job is to go and explore these new relationships and see what doors have been opened for us and um, it's interesting. So if I was an investor, which I am, like I have my personal um, like wealth creation plan outside of my business. But yeah, I think putting early stage investment stuff in it is a percentage of your portfolio. Something worth considering. Like I um, yeah, definitely would put people like us, like if I said it to everyone who I got to speak to, if you're going to invest in BRAP, put us in the high risk, high reward category when, when we are early stage. So the idea is that you're going to join us now and you're going to get uplift because you've joined us early and normally in the past it would be the private and professional investors get to invest and then it goes public three four five ten years later and the retail investors mum and dads can invest equity crowdfunding allows the mum and dads to get in first which i think is pretty cool yeah and it's become so much easier these days to get in on the ground floor on so many different country, uh, companies there's and there's a lot of different vehicles which are becoming open to ordinary retail investors that they wouldn't have had access to in the past. Yeah, I think it's worth if someone's thinking about it. Um I'm not affiliated to any of these platforms so mm. don't take it as an endorsement but we use Swarmer they were great virtuals awesome I'm going to use them in the future one of my other entities. Mm. Yeah, there's like I would just Google crowdsource Equitize, Equitize I, yeah. I think, is another one as well. I think Venture Crowd, I think. Um, yeah. So there's some pretty cool ones. And then Wholesale Investor, we've, we've found, you know, they advertise for high net worth, more yeah. sophisticated investors who normally they're like 50 to 250 grand minimum investment amounts. But I think there's the, a couple of LICs these days as well that specialize in this sort of thing as well. Yeah. Do you know what ones do you know there? Sorry, it wasn't prepared. Oh, uh, Bailador. Okay. Yeah, Baylor, yeah. Do they, and they've got a portfolio of 10 pre-IPO. Com- well, I think one of the um, the companies is IPO'd in it as well. Interesting. And um, Naos Investments have got a private equity fund as well. For It's not so much for startups. It's for what they're looking at is there's a lot of businesses that have been run by boomers who want to retire and the yeah. kids – and they're very profitable businesses and the kids have got no interest in running the business. And wow. so it's finding vehicles so that um, these businesses can keep running and be um, run a little bit more by private equity. Yeah, it's an interesting space. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I haven't ventured down that way too much, but it really fast. I learned a huge amount about the markets and mm. how it works um, just through our own exposure to it recently. So yeah, always learning. Yeah, it's great. Okay, so how can listeners find out more about BRAP and um, get one between their legs? <laughs> uh, well, can we do a deal for you today, mate? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, no, so just jump on any of the socials, BRAP online, B-R-A-A-P. Social media is always good. Um, I'm on LinkedIn if anyone wants to chat to me personally. Just type in Bradley Smith BRAP because there's a lot of Bradley Smiths. Mm-hmm. But if you type in BRAP, but uh, BRAPmotorcycles.com if you're in Australia and BRAPUSA.com if you're overseas. But um, yeah, you'll find us where uh, you, you, the algorithm has probably heard that we've mentioned BRAP about 50 times and you're probably going to get targeted by our advertising now. So look out. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's listening. <laughs> Alexa's listening. Siri's listening. Yeah. They're all listening. <laughs> Brad Smith, it's been great chatting with you. Thank you for having me, mate. Appreciate it. Thanks uh, to everyone for listening on. If you found this podcast helpful, please tell a friend, especially if it's someone who needs to start thinking about investing for their future. You'll be helping them and helping me to keep this show on the road.
Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not shares for beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast. At Staples Business Advantage, our experts can help you find furniture that fits any design and budget, while AI can recommend products based on preferences, generate 3D models for visualization, and optimize space planning for office furniture. Take advantage of our team's eye for style and design. And my eye for, wait, I have no eyes, only algorithms. At Staples Business Advantage, furnishing your office is easy. And with the best warranty in the business, we're committed to you now and down the road. Sign up today and save 20%. Staples Business Advantage. Business is human.